Awesome. Okay, cool. Hi, uh, and thank you and welcome uh, to my talk. Uh, I'm happy to be at the Blockspace house to talk about Blockspace. It makes sense. Um, yeah, so uh, we're going to be talking about uh, Blockspace uh, more from the perspective of Polkadot, but also kind of like diving into um, like what it means and, and how it is and what can be done with the the block space provided by Polkadot uh, specifically, but I'm definitely open to talk uh, to any other sorts of chains and protocols as well. Um, so yeah, I'm my name is Phil. Um, uh, my formal background is in linguistics, um, which I did a bachelor's in. Um, then I did a lot of marketing and communications for Web two technologies, um, but I've I dove into Bitcoin in 2013, and I've been working with startups uh, in the crypto space ever since. Um, yeah, I worked at Parity, uh, which really kind of helped my knowledge around Polkadot uh, forever, and now I'm starting Elastic. So from the perspective of Polkadot, um, Polkadot was thought of as a heterogeneous sharded blockchain, which is a way of saying, you know, it has a lot of roll-ups on this L1 that secures it and provides interoperability and interchain communication between those chains, as well as providing the security for all those L2s. Um, and the way they allocated this, this these um, limited supply of slots was through auctions in the parachain model. So parachains provide secure and available block space. And the relay chain, which sits above it or below it, depending on your perspective, um, provides the validity and availability guarantees, as well as interoperability capabilities between those chains. Um, it uses something called the validation function, which uh, is the way of determining if a parachain is behaving uh, as expected uh, to its users and uh, to the parachain itself. And there is a limited supply of uh, parachain slots. So the number of parachains cannot be infinite. There is, uh, There are some restraints on this, namely because of the validation function. So if you compare this to Ethereum L2s, um, the limited block space that they have is their, their uh, fraud proof computation or ZK uh, roll up computation as well on chain. But that's kind of an optional thing at this stage for L2s on Ethereum, whereas it's pretty much required f to be, uh, you need to be validated by the main chain on Polkadot, which is optional in Ethereum so far. Uh, so why auctions? Um, well, auctions are, are a great way of like determining market price without uh, the engineers providing too much opinionation about how much something would cost. Um, and they're good at efficiently allocating this uh, supply. So the way it was set up is that there's one auction for one slot every two weeks or so. Uh, and this could also be controlled by on-chain governance. So there was a pause in parachain auctions for a while, uh, and then they restarted again. Uh, that was by... Uh, and then, like an auction helps find the, that natural market price um, and without giving any opinionation. So they were designed to efficiently allocate a limited resource. And it was done in a very interesting way. I really found this to be interesting where the auction would start uh, and then people would place their bids. Um, and then the actual time it started to measure was uh, in this ending period for five days. Um, where the leading uh, bidder would win, uh, depending on the end time, which would then be determined by a random function. So from he before the auction begins, you know that it's going to be measuring from uh, two days to seven days. And uh, you just have to be in the lead as much as possible during then. You can't just like win at the end and expect to get the parachain slot because once the auction is over, there's a random function that determines when the end actually was after the fact. It's a VRF on Polkadot that does that. So if you were in the lead here for like one block, uh, you have like a super, super slim chance of still winning uh, the entire auction. And we've seen this happen where um, some teams have, have won in surprising scenarios, such as on Kusama network, we had Altair network, which is uh, uh, Centrifuge's network. Um, where this chain was 
winning for the majority of the time, but because of the random function determined that the end of the auction was here, that was when Altair was in the lead. So Altair won that slot. Um, this is a way of like really avoiding that sniping at the end where you can just you know, hide and everything, and it does incentivize uh, teams to front load their bids, so it's more transparent, so we can hopefully expect uh, uh, an outcome that isn't so surprising, but this one was one of those few cases. Yeah, and it was done to, yeah, discourage auction sniping as well as like front running, um, and to encourage transparency in early full bids. And, you know, you might have heard, uh, but there were a lot of, you know, complaints uh, from the community we listened to and, you know, learned with them on uh, what are some of the things that really didn't go so well for parachain auctions. Um, but there were definitely some things that, that were uh, good, that the auctions are good for. Um, it's market efficient or fair, you know, the highest bidder kind of wins. Um, you can do these things called crowd loans, where if you're a project with not a lot of capital, but uh, the community is excited for your project, they can uh, lock up their dot in your favor, so uh, bid up your auction for you if you don't have those resources available. And it's good at, at you know, the resource management, like what chain should you go when uh, for this, the most desired chain first. But it has strong disadvantages, which is the unpredictability of an auction. It can go any way. If you're a team, you're really ready to launch, you're ready to go, um, and somebody outbids you, you got to wait, um, which is extremely unpredictable. Um, and you don't know exactly how much money you're going to need to lock up. You do get those dots back at the end of the two years, but it's, yeah. Um, the other thing is, is like when you're done with your two-year lease, uh, which is what you get on, a, on an auction, uh, you have to get another uh, slot auction, which is also competitive again. So it makes it very uncertain and complex to renew those slots. And as, as much as people think that you know auctions are fair, they're also unfair in other ways too. If you don't, if you're not a big fan of market economics, so. Um, we can see here with this graph, um, at the beginning of Polkadot, they were, they were going crazy with like tons of huge uh, amounts of DOT being locked up. Uh, and then they all got unlocked recently, again, for the first time. It was, it was great to see. Um, but even in the last few auctions, um, during the bear market, we've seen a high demand for Polkadot's core time and block space. With you know uh, the lowest bids being around, um, you know, $100,000 and the highest ones being up to uh, 1.5 million. But somewhere around here is the average, which is um, uh, around 800, 900,000 uh, per month. And so with all these advantages and disadvantages, uh, it was about time to rethink Polkadot in a way that, like, what is it really providing? Um, there's, you know, these parachains that, that we're doing, they basically are computing something, and each slot is a core. So that's what really came up with uh, the rationale for core time. It's, first of all, to address the shortcomings and disadvantages of parachain auctions, um, and to create a more future-proof and extensible platform um, that will expand the potential audience and user base of Polkadot, um, which I'll get to as well. Um, and there's two major sections I want to cover in this uh, for core time. So one is the procurement, like how do I get it, which is the auction process, and utilization, what you can do with it. Uh, but first, like what is core time really? And um, Rob, who's here, uh, <laughs> I thought that this was a good um, good overview of it. Block space and core time are two sides of the same coin. Block space is that raw material created by blockchains, which is decentralized security and code execution. And core time is Polkadot's measurement and allocation mechanism for block space. Um, and it's kind of like core time is like the ticket to your block space. So how do you get it? Um, if you don't have auctions anymore, um, you know, 
they're unpredictable, it's uncertain about your renewal, and it's like it can range wildly uh, in price uh, as well. Um, and this is, I think, a very helpful way for many in the Polkadot community especially to kind of understand the differences. Um, so first of all, with slot auctions, you lock your dot um, and you get it back after the time expires. With uh, core time, you're actually just purchasing it, and it's going to likely, if the governance decides to agree with the fellowship, which is most likely, uh, the dot will be burnt. So um, it's a straight up purchase that you don't get back. Um, the procurement model is obviously an auction. You get a lease, so you're paying for a lease like you would rent uh, a month. The duration is up to two years, and for core time, it's once a month. Each sale is once a month, which sounds pretty hectic and wild, but I'll get to how we can get around that. Um, the minimum commitment time is six months, and for core time, the minimum commitment is one block, which is really, that changes the game as far as the required resources that are needed to secure yourself and secure your chain on Polkadot. There was one slot per auction, which is uh, two slots per month. And um, with core time, we're still not exactly sure what's, what it's going to look like on Kusama and Polkadot. Um, but there will be multiple cores per sale per month, um, at definitely more than two per month. Um, and that will eventually have its own, just like with parachain auctions, it's a limited supply. We're going to have a limited supply of core time, but thanks to some recent advancements in Polkadot, such as asynchronous backing, you know, larger uh, validation functions and so on, uh, we can scale this up from like the 60 we have to at least 200 uh, slots. Uh, cores, and hopefully a lot more too. Um, there's not been a lot of good stress testing data on this yet, uh, but it, we can. We're pretty confident we can get up to 200 very within the next year. Uh, with renewals, slot auctions, there was no guarantee, and with core time, there is a guaranteed renewal mechanism, and that is rent controlled. So you can have a predictable price over the next year or two going forward. Uh, this this means that you can tell your investors or you can tell your community like, hey, we need this much dot in order to secure our, our ourselves for the next two years, uh, for the next five years, and so on. You can predict it uh, pretty easily. The cost uh, of the slot itself um, is uh, around 16000 per month um, on average, and it varies wildly. And this is an opportunity cost for those dots that are locked. So this is like the, r the rewards you would get if by staking it. Um, Core time sales are not yet determined, but l highly likely, after a lot of discussion and recent, advent recent updates, that it'll be around uh, 1,000 to 1,500 per month per core, uh, which is something that's affordable for a lot of teams, um, especially if you're gonna, like, if your alternatives are other sort of like layer one securing mechanisms, which are also quite expensive. What we've done to calculate the cost is really look at what are the validators doing as part of this work to validate that and try to have it competitive to any sort of AWS instance. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's like how you get it. Um, and this is like something I want to throw in here is like how it's built. Uh, what's cool about core time uh, as opposed to the previous uh, architecture is that there's not a lot, like there's a lot we can reuse. Uh, so what's not new right now is the proof of validity or validation function for now. Um, and uh, it's still a limited resource. Uh, the block space that Polkadot provides is ample, but the cores will still be relatively scarce. I mean, 200 is a, is a good amount of execution power. Um, but yeah, it's still like in the grand scheme of things, 200 isn't a huge supply. But for each core, you get tons of block space, one megabyte per second to be precise. Which is, uh, if you want to compare this to something comparable, it's blob space on Ethereum. If you've heard of EIP 4844, uh, that's providing blobs specifically for rollups to use for data availability. Um, and for EIP 4844, um, it's it's only it's the first iteration uh, for Ethereum, so it's not going to be the total amount. But what what's taken about three years to develop will provide about point. 00625 megabytes per second compared to the 60 megabytes per second we see right now in Polkadot. 
what is new is on demand core time, which is like pay as you go. That's the, the thing where you can just get one block. If you just want to have one advancement uh, every whenever you want, you can do that with, with Polkadot, which is something that has a nice secondary side effect I think I would like people to explore, which is, um, you know, one of w a big uh, debate in many different ecosystems is w what should we set the inflation rate at? You know, like how do we know that this is the right amount of inflation, too much or too little? Um, and this is something that, like, you know, Bitcoin was supposed to solve by, you know, central banks controlling the inflation rate. Well, Bitcoin just predetermined it and set it and forget it. But something else you can do with uh, on-demand core time is say, well, let's just build up, let's create a threshold of, like, every 100 transactions, we create a block. Because we know that those 100 transactions will be worth more than the inflation we're creating um, uh, by producing a new block and rewarding validators. So you can set up things that have like actual market-driven inflation where you wouldn't even need to worry about setting it. Uh, only you're only setting the, the, the ratio and not the actual amount uh, per minute or per time unit. It's actually per usage unit. Um, and on-demand core time lives on the relay chain, whatever. <laughs> um, and uh, so what is new is that there's another system parachain uh, called the core time chain, which is being provided by the Web3 Foundation and uh, will be, you know, obviously public and for everyone to use. And this helps with that uh, procurement of bulk core time, so where you can get a full month's worth of core, core time. This also handles assignments, which are, I have this core, I want to assign it to my chain. That's how you do it. It records that in the core time chain. You also have the ability to trade this, which is really cool. And uh, I'm not seeing this anywhere else. Um, you can also do interlacing, region splitting, all this fancy sort of um, scheduling stuff. So it, think of it as a, a processor. You can use the same core for multiple chains at the same time, or you can also, that's interlacing, or you can also do region splitting or partitioning where, you know, every um, 80 blocks chain A gets validated and the next ch uh, 80 blocks chain B gets validated. And there's also uh, the ability of core time credits. So um, this is where you know, hackathon teams and so on can, they don't have DOT or whatever, um, we're gonna allocate some core time credits from the treasury to give to cool teams that they can, they can use. So, how do I get it? We've, we've done that. Um, what do I need to get it uh, for bulk core time sales? Uh, they occur once per month for, uh, for a seven day window, although you can still buy it after the fact if you want. Um, and you can also renew it uh, if you already have a core, and there's multiple cores sold each sale. I think I'm like Rococo, there's like about 50 cores being sold a month, which is way too high, and they've already admitted that, um, so it's going to be definitely much less than that. Uh, yeah, the lead-in period is seven days, that's like the real sale period, which is using a Dutch auction, sort of like starting from a relatively higher price and going down over that seven day period. Then you have the utilization period, which is actually, you're using it. Uh, if you buy it within that seven day period, you wait until the utilization period starts. And now that you've had it, you're using it for two weeks, uh, you get a seven day window before the sale period or the lead in period where you can renew it uh, before it hits the open market. And this is rent controlled as well. So as I said, if you buy it for, um, if you buy a core for $1,000, um, you can, the most you'll pay the next month, regardless of the open market or secondary market prices, would be um, 1050 And then it goes up 5% per month uh, if the demand is, is uh, exceeding supply. And so, yeah, the bulk limit is the amount, it's a bit more of the code stuff, um, but that's the amount that's being offered per month, and the bulk target is the amount that uh, we would like to sell per month. And that target uh, price is, if, if we're selling, say, 10 cores a month, that would be the bulk limit. And if we have a bulk target of five, um, that determines how the price reacts for the primary market the next month. So if we sell four cores, the price will go down, the next month, and if we sell six cores, the price will go up. Um, 
Yeah, and every month this happens again and again. And it sounds like a big he heavy load for for a developer or a team because it's happening once a month and you have to pay attention. But there's w there's definitely ways of automating this uh, that uh, we're gonna do. So one thing we've built at Elastic is because we need to understand this market is a price simulator. Um, it's a bit complicated to to figure out at first, but um, this kind of gives a good visualization of how things can go if you're going above that target number. So if more cores are more than half cores are being sold per month, the price will increase uh, and so on. So let's start right here. Um, this is what's called the lead-in period or the sell period. There's this Dutch auction that starts at 2x the initial price. And this will be set, this is opinionated, this will be set by governance and the, the devs uh, around $1,000, let's just say. And it starts at 2x, and over the course of seven days, it just descends, descends, descends down. So if you really want to guarantee yourself uh, some core time, you just buy it at the beginning. Or you can like probably put a nice sniping uh, you know, transaction in there that just waits for the third or second to last one so you get the cheapest price, and so on. So let's say you get it at 1500 here, and that guarantees you a core. You use this, and then the next... <laughs> The next uh, one you can renew, and you only renew it at a slightly higher price because all these cores are, are being sold higher than the demand function. But the market price would be something around uh, 1200 or 1300 the next month. And then so on, it can go to 2000 uh, 2500 and so on. It, it can go up uh, relatively quickly if you're just buying on the open market. But if you are um, renewing by if you're renewing your core, you can have that very, very uh, predictable for the next, um, you know, especially if you're denominating in DOT for the next years. Um, let's see if there's anything, any questions on this part so far? Oh, yeah, that's a bad, uh, that's, yeah, yeah. This is, um, this is arbitrary, but like each one of these are, are for sales. Don't, this isn't a good uh, y, uh, x axis here. So it's it's really about the time. This is time, just simply time. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, no, it, it does not. It, 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 uh, any, a full core is, is priced at a certain thing. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a big part of uh, of like, do you want to buy more than you're producing, you know, and you want to somehow get that that nice sweet spot where you're sort of profitable as a chain, where you're not paying too much for the block space you're using. And the thing is, like, if you're buying a full core that's like a, a megabyte a second of of throughput, you might not need that much. And so what you could do is either start with that on-demand core time. Uh, where you just buy a block whenever you need it, or you can, because you can split it up into these these different ways, you might want to buy a core that you would share with other teams and say, I only need every other block or ev a block every 10 minutes or a stream of blocks at a certain amount of time, um, and uh, then I wouldn't be paying for it. And I could, s I could sell the rest to other people to make sure that I'm not overpaying for my execution time. Yeah? Okay. You're right now you're buying basically the idea is 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 still in its early stages where it's very polka dot focused and so you're 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 a parachain, you developed some sort of chain. Um, if you were here earlier to see the Tansy talk, like they make it super easy now, which is really nice. So if you have one of these and you want to deploy it on Polkadot, you would use Elastic to get the core time you need to secure yourself and get that, that secure block space. So on Polkadot Relay Chain. So yeah, you get, you get the, the security from the Relay Chain, but your own chain will have like the storage and the data availability and the execution. Yeah, 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 
Yeah, you could you could have a nested uh, core time chain that would be a little complicated. And but honestly, uh, what Tansy is doing is most akin to that. So if you don't need if you don't need um, like a lot of core time and they they have more uh, av availability like if all the tansy chains are using less than one megabyte they won't probably need to do that unless they want full interoperability and security or and, and more like more sovereignty um, but as soon as they get like you know a bunch of chains deployed and they have a lot of interest already um, those kind of first ones who really want to overflow out into the system uh, can will use elastic to do that. We've actually been working with Tansy on integrating ourselves so that if you're a chain, you need that block space, you just use Elastic from Tansy. And if you're Elastic, you get this block space, what do I do with it? Use, use Tansy chains to deploy something quickly. Um, so yeah. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, the capabilities haven't been even fully uh, tested yet. So we had the inscription madness in December, uh, and we didn't. We had like tons of transactions on the relay chain. Uh, it didn't even use it all up. And um, there is a minimum fee. Yeah, yeah, but it's very very small. Like. Yeah, you could put. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But there there is a minimum fee because so like the only there's no like gasless stuff on on Polkadot. Uh there there's some ways you can sponsor uh transactions and then uh I was also talking to uh, the guy from Polemic uh, Protocol, and they're by nature they're trying to do like a very compliant uh, chain where everybody is KYC'd, and since everyone's KYC'd, you can ha you can have gasless a gasless chain, because you can then like rate limit per person. Um, How do you mean? Like, Yeah, it could. S it could. So e yeah, that's what I thought too. There's a very important detail in this. No, no, no. This is fine. No, that's because I I thought through this as well, um, and like I thought of that too. But I was reading the spec closer, and so there's a very important detail with re with regards to renewal. So if I'm a parachain, and I I want this renewal. Like I want to be able to renew every month because then I get it cheaper and I can not think about it. I can automate that and I don't need to worry about the, se the secondary market price or the primary market open market price. Um, however, when I can only renew if I'm using my core and I don't split it up. So as soon as I split it up to sell it, I can't renew it. And that's a very important detail. So if you're a parachain, you should not split up your blocks. You should not split up your core. Unless you buy an extra core. Okay. Where you like, OK, we're going to have some extra computation requirements next month. Uh, we have a big drop happening. Let's get an ex extra core or two to make sure that we're not going to like spike our gas fees. But at the time of the launch comes, uh, we didn't need that much. We can start selling that extra block space and still maintain our renewal to our parachain slot, so to say. Yeah, it's rent controlled too, which, which, uh, yeah, I have some, I'm curious to see how this is going to work in practice because, um, I mean, as, as somebody who's building a secondary market, so an unregulated market on top of a rent controlled market, it's kind of cool because then like we can go crazy and like the rent control is going to keep this 
market in high demand um, with cheap prices, but on the secondary market it could spill over and we could actually find real market prices. No, not now with the way. So if if I need block space, I would use a separate core. If I need, you could compete for the. So yeah, you get one block every six seconds, in per core. So the only, the so all of Polkadot. There's let's say there's sixty cores, which there's about sixty cores right now. Um, there might be more at this point. I'm not sure. Um, um, there's about 60 cores right now. You get one block, so that means there's 60 blocks being produced every six seconds, 12 six seconds, but there's, let's just say six seconds. Um, and the only competition is like, if I have my core, I'm not competing with it. I know I'm gonna get my block every six seconds for my core. Yeah, if you own a core, yes. No, no, it's just it just gets it's an empty block. It's an empty block still with a header and uh, and all that stuff. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's still it, but that's on your your chain. So the only time you would compete with the blocks is if like um if all the resources get filled up and then like people start splitting and selling and then like people will compete to bid in in our marketplace to get uh the certain blocks at certain times. They're not completely anal analogous. What did I have that on here? With um, yeah, so uh, interlacing is is that thing where you can do that. like we don't see this happening honestly in very much or region splitting. So interlacing is like f there's a block, and I want multiple chains to use this block and I can split up a single block so that multiple chains can get validated on a single block. I don't see the demand for this anytime soon um, from a market perspective uh, because it's just like simpler and easier to just buy up a core you know and, or get the on-demand core yourself. This is in region splitting this is like when you can um, split it up per over time. And I just don't see this as being in such high demand until we hit our, our limits. Yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly. T ten years ahead. Yeah. Exactly. It's a brand new thing. We we don't know for sure, but uh, that's the thing. Like so, uh, there's been some good like tooling that's been coming out there about you know how much is each core actually utilizing. And like right now, we don't see a lot of cores actually utilizing their full cores, even if they are pretty popular uh, parachains as well. Um, so like there's a lot of block space, but again, uh, we're not going to see parachains split up their cores anytime soon. Um, because the cost the uh, cost is too high to go back to the open market and not just renew. And there's yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it's good though. <laughs> no, I'm I'm happy about the questions. So um, yeah, as as I was saying, so with like right now, it's it's for parachains still, and this is the thing that's like um, it's interesting. So. What Tansy is doing is really helping this. Uh, that's why we're like a natural partnership in this space. Um, they take care of like the templates of, of creating your own chains and everything so that you can do that. So if you want on-demand core time, you need basically like a one block at a time. You still need the basic kind of parachain requirements, which are you need some dot to buy those that core time. You need a para ID, which is basically a chain ID. Um, with with the deposit on that, you need a Wasm blob and Genesis head. So you actually need that. What is my chain logic? 
uh, my chain can allow these transactions and doesn't allow anything else. That gets uploaded to the to the relay chain so that they can actually validate it. Um, and then you need collators, which are sequencers, basically running uh, on the back end, ready to be used on this. And that is what parachains need today, basically. They need all these things on, on, on top of some other stuff. Um, for bulk core time, all you need is dot. Um, if you want to utilize it, though, as a parachain, then you need all these things, too. But what the cool thing is, all you need is dot because when you buy core time, what you're actually getting behind the scenes is an NFT that gives you access to core time. And that NFT is more of a semi-fungible token, I guess, because it can be split up into multiple NFTs as well. So uh, which, which makes it possible to trade. And that's, that's something that allows something like a real block space marketplace to happen, um, which I'll get to as well. Uh, yeah, same. These are the u user requirements for block utilization. Okay, yeah, that's th the core time chain is what provides that. So the core time chain has a bunch of cores that go on sale. And, and are assigned and everything. It's the bookkeeping of who owns what. And when I buy a core, uh, it says I own it, and that I could either trade it or assign it or split it up or, yeah, utilize it myself or utilize it for somebody else or split it up into multiple things that then can be utilized or further traded down the road as well. So th all these things are kind of needed right now because we're still kind of on the parachain model until something called Core Jam and Core Play come, which, uh, yeah, is going to change everything for Polkadot. So, yeah, parachains. That's what you utilize Core Time for right now. Um, and it's going to be officially launched on Kusama next month. Um, On-demand parachains, which are these like pay-as-you-go ones. Uh, Multi-core chains and dApps, which is like really cool this is this allows so if you really have a lot of throughput uh requirements high data you know high computation you can do something called elastic scaling where you start off with one core but then you can get multiple cores to do different things so then i can i have a six second block time with one core if i get two cores i can theoretically have three second block times three cores, two second block times, and so on. Um, and this also gives you more throughput. And what the elastic scaling part is, is that I don't necessarily need to have all these cores at once, but if I have peaks in high demand and my chain notices that, it can buy more cores on the marketplace to elastically scale, keep fees for the user low, while actually accumulating more total fees. Something like ephemeral chains is something we want to see more of uh, experimented with, where chains come and go. They're meant to die. Um, this is something that I, I, I don't know of any good uh, experimentation with this, but I'd like to see some more. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, like uh, there's an old talk Gav did a long time ago about that. Um, uh, yeah, smart contracts, uh, dApps uh, via Core Jam and Core Jam, Core Play. Um, so contracts can be eventually run directly on cores. So you won't need all of those requirements for parachains in the future, which changes the whole game for Polkadot. Uh, it's going to take some time to get there. Um, I, I think, uh, yeah, we have a, a new VM coming, which is written in Risk Risk Five that uh, can really just compile anything to, to our VM there. I mean, in what, wh what way permissionless? That's what I think. <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, permission really means, like, if governance, uh, you need to approve. So, for instance, shared security model on Polkadot is you get a core or you get a slot. On Cosmos, uh, their shared security model is you got to be voted in by governance. And to me, that's more uh, permissioned than what Polkadot has. If, if uh, money is your permissioning, then everything's permissioned. You know, it's like, yeah.
yeah just deploy on a core use by one block and and then if you need uh again you build up some some transactions by another block and and get it moving a step forward again so yeah or you can or or you can deploy it as a bulk core where it's constantly running for a month as well um and the way another way you can utilize it is trading and speculation and brokering uh which is what we're trying to do with Lastic. um so core time markets yeah block space markets essentially um and this comes back from rob I, this is my second rob is here too and uh but yeah he wrote this amazing article block space over blockchains uh in october 2022 uh, where he even mentions this, uh, he's like, we can pursue the ability to transfer claims on execution cores. Um, is, he's talking about cores uh, eight months before core time was announced here. Um, this will create a secondary market for Polkadot block space. Chains will be able to trade extra capacity with each other and act as resellers for block space. Chains experiencing lower or higher demand than anticipated will be able to adapt accordingly and perhaps even speculate on future demand of block space. And that's like where we're coming in with Elastic. Uh, we want to be able to provide at least this, this way of trading block space. I can give a quick demo too. Um, I'll, I'll, sh I'll show, I'll, I'll, I can buy a core live on this talk uh, on Rococo. On the testnet. Yeah, yeah we can, it's on testnet right now. So one thing I, I did, I got some good advice from Sean Tabrizi uh, when I was talking to him about this idea. He's like, uh, you know, what you should do is like, just like try doing it yourself. Like don't, you don't have to build up the whole thing, just do it yourself. And I, and he's, then I was talking like, is it possible to trade Paris parachain leases like before core time exists on? And um, it is actually. They did a governance upgrade uh, six months prior where you can actually trade leases uh, because people were having issues and they needed different things. So th using the old parachain model, I participated myself with my own KSM on an auction and I won a parachain slot. And I saw I was, I was, saw I was outbidding two other parachain teams. And I, I won, um, luckily demand was so low, it was like the lowest demand, so I got, I got, I got a super cheap. Um, and I wasn't even winning the whole time, like once they came in with like 100 KSM and were like 40% chance of winning and I, the candle auction uh, had me win. So uh, I immediately like reached out to those two teams uh, and the team that was really like interested was uh, Astar Network, uh, Shiden. Astar uh, has, yeah, nice, yeah. Yeah, they're a great team. So uh, I reached out to them, and like being this is me being a, a block space broker here, you know, a core time broker. Like, hey, do you want this? And they're like, oh, thank you. We didn't want to deal with the auction again, you know. Like, uh, we we were sad we missed out on it, but yeah, this would be huge help. So I I said okay, I I secured this slot for. It was like 3.1 KSM. It was the cheapest uh, win of uh, a KSM auction ever. Um, and then I'm like, here, just give me 6.2 KSM and some Shiden tokens, because uh, like for for their Shiden network. So I, I was able to get some of their own tokens as well, which is something that's like you couldn't, you can't do anymore as the crowd loan model. So there's other ways we need to think about that with this new model, where maybe people want to be brokers and say, I don't need the DOT or KSM, I want a lot of your tokens, which those projects will have a lot of their own tokens and not a lot of DOT or KSM. So that's something we're trying to push the idea forward and we did a successful XCM transfer of the, the leases and uh, I got their old slot and they got my new slot. And so there is demand for this. Um, and yeah, that's it, but here, let's, uh, let's do a quick demo. Um, hold on. Here, so this is, oh, it's all messed up because the different size. Hold on. Okay, here we go. So this is uh, the test network version of Elastic. It's on the Rococo core time right now. Um, and right now, as I said, you know, this is the renewal period. And then this is the sale period where you have this linear de decreasing price. And then we're in the utilization period right now. Or we're at the stabilization period. Okay, yeah, we're at the stable price period. And this will be the utilization period. So sales is gonna end soon in uh, a day and an hour. So 25 hours from now, sales is gonna end and my core can start to get utilized. Um, I can go down here. The current price is like r extremely low on the test network, of course. There's 51 cores available. There's tw 28, uh, no, 51 cores total that were 
for sale this period, and there's 28 still uh, sold out of those 51 cores. Um, you can see like a monthly price per core. You can see the the different transactions that have been done from other people, um, and how much they bought it for. Um, yeah, and as you can see, the price is decreasing over these purchase periods, so that the that that function is 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 working really well. So let's buy a core on Rococo. Um, I have some I have some uh, dot uh, testnet dot here. Okay, and it's broadcast. And let's see, hopefully Rococo was in its in block. So I have th that core now. And so if I go back, if I go over to my cores, and it's here, here's the core I just purchased. And so I, I have a bunch of cores. Um, I kind of might have bought a lot. Don't, don't, oh, shoot, no, it's being recorded here. Um, <laughs> and now what I can do is, like for now, it's again, we're going to have, you know, combined, split up. Uh, I can transfer it and assign it. So assign it, all you need to do is put my para ID in here. Uh, for my parachain, and it's it starts functioning uh, as soon as the utilization period starts. Uh, I just type in my my ID, my chain ID, basically. But I can also transfer it. So if somebody wants to give me, um, do you have a Rococo address, Sasha? Yeah. S send it to me on Telegram. Yeah. yeah. It's it's literally an NFT, uh, and uh, what he can do now is he can spin up a chain in the next 25 hours and assign the core to himself, his own chain, whatever he wants to do with it, and start utilizing the block space on Polkadot. Um, yeah. You're sending? Yeah. Okay, hold on. Uh, I want to be careful here. Okay, cool. Up. I want to be careful here. Hold on. Just don't want to expose all my chats here. <laughs> okay, boom. Okay, sweet. So, boom. Transfer. Got to approve again. No, this is a this is it's broadcast. Uh, and and uh, and you should you should uh, be able to go to test.lastic.xyz uh, and log in with that Rococo address and see your core. <laughs> so are you on test elastic? Yeah. Yep, that's the one I just transferred. So you are the proud owner of of a core on on Rococo. So yeah. So the the next thing we got to work out is uh, the the real marketplace part, uh, which we're going to do. So the ability to put up like I want X amount of dot for this core. Yeah, I can help you out after for sure. I can uh, definitely help you guys later set that up and you know just play around with it. There's it it's um, about what you can do right now, but we're as far as the um, uh, the marketplace comes, uh, we're gonna we're, that's what we're working on right now. So the ability to put up uh, bids and asks for block space on Polkadot, um, and we're thinking maybe way bigger than uh, than this even. So uh, definitely stay tuned. Um, follow our Twitter. Um, and yeah, thank you for listening.